Drive up your engine! Okay, here I have a 2008 Toyota Highlander. The AC's not cold. The customer bought it about six months ago and the AC was a little bit cold, but now it doesn't work at all. So what am I assuming? Loss of refrigerant. First, let's hook up the gauge. Now there's low side and high side. We're gonna hook up the low side first. We get the low side. It's the one that says L, obviously L. It's down there. Not the greatest place to access, but I've seen worse. I'll have to adjust this so it goes up. Now at least I can get it in the hole. Try to snap it on. You gotta wiggle it and snap it on. And in this case, there's not much wiggling room. There. Then we'll turn the handle. That opens the valve up. It's got 65 pounds pressure. It should do something. So let's turn it on. Start it up. Put it on AC full blast. There we go, full blast. Let's look at it. We shut the AC off, and as you can see now, the compressor isn't spinning anymore. We'll turn it back on, make sure it's full blast, and as we look down, we can see it's spinning again. So the compressor's spinning. When we look at the gauge, it's pretty much the same. Now we're going to check the high pressure too. Look up the other gauge to the high side, which of course says H. Snap it on. No, it's got 100 pounds. And the other has 60 pounds running. So, if we're lucky, it could just be low on refrigerant. When I go inside, this side is cooler than that side. This is outside air temperature. This is a little cooler. This is somewhat cooler. And that's a lot cooler over there. When you're low on refrigerant, evaporators in there will often blow a little cooler on the other side. So we're going to add some refrigerant and see what happens. The tank's here. It's going to have refrigerant when I open it up. And we'll watch the high side pressure. Here we go. We're going to open it up. We hope that the high side starts to go up some. It's not going up all that much. And as we can see on the low side, the low side is way too high. It should run maybe 30, 35. The high side could run 180, 190. The low side being that high, there's serious problems. Now I'll check the cooling fans. That fan spinning. The other fan spinning, so the fans are working. If the fans don't work, the pressures will get too high, but these fans are working. It's not the fans. For some reason, the low side is too high, but the high side is too low. But the compressor's still spinning. I'm guessing on this baby, the compressor's just worn out, sucking and compressing correctly. Because the high side should be higher. And if the high side doesn't compress it enough, you won't get high enough pressure to cool it down. The low side can stay too high because the compressor isn't sucking it in fast enough. Seems like a compressor failure to me. But it could be a lot worse. So I'm gonna get my fancy scan tool out. Realize even a 12 year old Toyota, the HVAC system, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning is all computer run. So we're gonna do a big scan and see if there's anything shows weird on that. AC work used to be a lot easier, but with these fancy compressors that are computer run, a lot of things can go wrong that you need a really good computer to diagnose it with. Because I've had customers, they just guessed and said, oh, I'm going to change the compressor because it's obviously not pumping right. Only to find out that the compressor was okay, but it was all the stupid computers weren't controlling it correctly. They wasted 800 bucks and didn't fix anything. But nothing looks particularly bad from the data itself. And as we look on the trouble codes, unfortunately, it doesn't have any. Now since this vehicle was purchased used, and he said the AC never worked all that well, we know nothing of the history of the vehicle. There's no codes, the data doesn't look bad, the compressor's spinning, but the pressures are all wrong. So I'm gonna suck all the refrigerant out with my recycling machine first. Then I'm gonna fill it up with a factory load by weight and pray something good happens. Cause if it doesn't, at a minimum, it's gonna need a compressor and it might need a whole lot more. Now you really never know who's worked on this car, what they've done. While I'm evacuating the system, what we're doing is we're making it neutral be completely empty. No air, no nothing. If somebody put too much refrigerant in, if they got air in the system, if they use the wrong refrigerant, they can all make them go bonkers. So what I'm going to do is empty out, put in a factory load and watch the gauges and see what happens. Now as we can see here, a maximum of 0.82 kilograms. So we got the scale at zero. We'll open it up and add 0.82 kilograms. When this says 
0.82 it's done. So we'll go inside and start it up with the compressor running. It'll fill up better. Start it up. Put the AC on full blast. Outside air. Then we'll watch the pressure. And as we can see, this is already starting to come up, which it should. Now the low side will always be higher while you're filling it up. You want this to get higher. And we stop when this does 0.82. And as you can see, this is climbing. Let's probably some idiot got air in it or overfilled the system. We'll see what's happening inside while it's filling up. And guess what? That's cool and that's getting cooler. Let's hope it fixes it. Now I have patience because it can take a while until it's fully filled up and this is 0.82. Realize I'm adding it as a gas. The tank is right side up. If I turned it upside down, it would add it as a liquid, which is much faster but it's also dangerous. The liquid can get in there and bend the compressor. You always want to add it with just the gas, not the liquid. Yes, it takes longer, but it's more accurate and it won't damage anything. Yeah, here we go. 0.82. We'll take the hoses off first and put the caps back on. First, you open them up and you pop them. Put the top back on, get it nice and snug and do the same thing down here. Don't burn your hands, there's not much room. That was put in a bad place. I would have put it someplace else. And put the low side cap back on. Get it nice and snug with your fingers. So we're buttoning it up and take it for a spin. And I can already tell the difference. That's cold, that's cold. Even that's cold. But we'll take it on a good 15 minute trip. And lo and behold, even though it's 95 degrees outside, it's nice and cool inside. On max cold. So realize, you got a car. You don't know what anybody's done to the AC system. Never assume that it doesn't have air in the system the wrong refrigerant, the wrong amount of refrigerant. If in doubt, you can't find any external things wrong like this. The compressor was spinning, there were no codes. Empty the system out. Fill it back up with a factory load and see what happens. In this case, it's blowing freezing cold now. Because yes, yeah, sometimes you get lucky and it's simple as emptying it out and filling it up with refrigerant fixes a bad AC system. Somebody messed with this, screwed it up, now it's working. The only thing we gotta worry about now is see how long the refrigerant lasts. Time will tell that. If it lasts more than six, eight months, that just means it's got a tiny leak. You know, you can fill it up every once in a while. But at least we didn't spend a ton of money on it and it's blowing cold. And here's some bonus questions and answers. Refat says, I plugged in my friend's blue driver in my 2016 Camry with 20,000 miles and P1604 code showed up but I don't have any issues. I searched online, found many probable fixes, but I see that there may nothing wrong with the car and there's a code for government regulatory purposes. Does something need to be addressed? Should I wait for an actual CEL? Yeah, just wait. You probably won't even get one. I get that all the time when I'm checking out Toyotas that people are buying used. It's just these stupid codes and sometimes it's because the car sat a little bit of time and it wasn't started and it makes these ridiculous codes that don't mean anything is wrong with a vehicle, just that it didn't didn't start absolutely perfectly the first time just ignore it on that that sometimes when you get into the technology the level can go so far that you don't even care and I'm a professional mechanic so I have to figure all this crap out let's say I'm checking out a used German car for a customer I tell them I'm gonna plug in a scanner I guarantee you I'm gonna find 17 to 27 codes or more but it doesn't mean it's a bad vehicle it just means that the interface of the computer system is wacky and some of the sensors are a tiny bit off but you don't really care overpower for electric windows I see that all the time with people that have long fingernail extensions those fake fingernails and when they pull up to make the window go up they hold it up too long and then it holds itself against the top longer and it actually by actual code that says over voltage the window because it was pushed up too long nothing wrong with a car it's just the person that has long fingernails and they hold it on too long so some of those codes mean nothing and that's another one that that's what it means absolutely nothing 202 rice says I'm thinking about getting a Nissan on Quest. Would you recommend them as good minivans? No. <laughs> Unless you're leasing one, then you know, then you don't care because if it breaks, it's not your dime that's paying for the repairs. But buying one, no, they're not that good vans. Nissan uses the Jetco transmissions, which Nissan owns the Jetco company, more or less. They're one of the worst transmissions in the world. They have engine problems. Don't, don't buy a Quest. You want a good minivan, get a Toyota. Sienna, you can't beat Toyotas. They make the best minivans in the world for the money. The Honda Odysseys are nice looking vans, fun to drive, but they've had all kinds of engine problems, transmission problems, air conditioning problems in the past with the Toyota.
Toyotas don't, get a Toyota. If you want to buy something and have it last forever, and if you want to pay less, buy a used Sienna. They go three, 400,000 miles, so if you buy one with 100,000 on it with a decent price, because it's got 100,000 miles, you can be a lot happier than even buying a new one of those stupid Nissan Questmans. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.